Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the next episode of our Owls and Virtual Play Conversation Series, where we discuss matters to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Jana Brady, a geography lecturer at Connecticut State University, and I teamed up with Southern's Office of International Education to moderate this series. Today, we're going to chat about a perennial, perennial favorite um, at Owls and Play, food. We absolutely love hearing about your cooking adventures, during the lockdown. So please feel free to show us pictures and tell us tales of the culinary delights that you've created over the last few months. Um, but also we really wanna hear about food culture in your community. What are your comforts, the foods that together? Uh, what are some stable ingredients you guys use or how is food traditionally prepared where you eat? Um, we all love traveling. And for most of us, that also includes eating. So um, when the world opens up again, tell us what we're going to do when we come and visit you. Um, can you start us off? So I am Portuguese, but I am originated from an island called Saltome. And there we eat a lot of fish, obviously. <laughs> but we also have a lot of um, tropical vegetables and things like that that we normally have with fish. Uh, and seafood, like octopus, squid, that's what we love. Um, Portuguese culture is also very, it's a bit similar, but they eat more with rice or fries or salad, potatoes, instead of all native vegetables that we would have. Um, since I, I am now living in the UK, so the food is very, very different, but uh, I do enjoy it. A lot of people say that UK food is not the best, but I do enjoy it. Um, I do enjoy pie. They have pies, but it's not made with pastry. It's made with, they put potato on top, uh, sweet potato or normal potato, and then they have the meat underneath. That's one of my favorite dishes here. It's called cottage pie or shepherd's ch pie. But during lockdown, I haven't been cooking all the time. <laughs> but because I'm living with my fa with a family, um, they cook mostly. But I did once try to do um, vegan burgers, but in instead of using meat, obviously we used um, banana skin, and then with barbecue, and it was actually really nice. <laughs> Have you, any of you tried something different during lockdown? Yeah, so um, my sister is gluten-free and I'm dairy-free. So I've tried a lot of different, you know, things to <laughs> try and get around that, especially because I love baking. But kind of on that vegan note, um, we made vegan taquitos with uh, jackfruit. Um, so, you know, we kind of made the jackfruit like you would if it were tacos, like m taco meat or something. Um, and then you wrap it in like a definitely a corn tortilla that tastes way better uh, with cheese and then a little bit of the jackfruit filling, maybe some onions. Uh, and then you cook it in the oven to make it nice and crispy. And it's just a little like roll. Like, I don't know if you've ever had a taquito, but, <laughs> um, and that was my first time ever trying jackfruit in a recipe and it was surprisingly good. I don't know if like, you know, some of my friends would approve, but my brother did and he's nowhere near vegan or anything. <laughs> so, yeah. It actually upsets me when people cook with jackfruit because we eat a lot of jackfruit at home and it's so mm. nice by himself. So I always think. Why are you cooking with it? But it must be interesting. <laughs> well, I think using canned jackfruit, which is generally what I have access to, is like not great, just plain. But if you have a fresh jackfruit, what I've heard is like, do not cook it. It just tastes so good by itself. Um, so... Sorry, I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I respect it, though. I'll... I'll find it one day <laughs> how about you maria okay so i just want to introduce a little bit of cultural background before i start 
So for Armenians, especially for girls and women, it's really important to know how to cook. So it's like a big plus in the marriage CV. So if you want to get married, you should know how to cook. But I was really busy for, um, I was busy in working on my career CV and I missed this marriage one. So <laughs> I used the lockdown period to work on my marriage CV and I started to learn how to cook. Um, Armenian, Armenian kitchen, Armenian cuisine is really uh, hard. Like the most... Um, primitive uh, dish you should uh, you should cook like three or four hours and the hardest one is you should pay uh, you should cook like all night or maybe a day so it's you should be really aware of how to do that so I started cooking and I started to learn how to make them uh, one of the interesting things that we have is called dorma it's like um, grape list it's like a leaf grape leaf and you put there some meat and you make a roll from it and it cooks all together and it's really tasty um it has like winter version with grape leaves and summer version with cabbage and uh, still it looks easy but you, sh you should know how to do it and uh, there are some secrets that your mom or grandma should tell you. Uh, I was spending some time to make this and uh, actually we had no problem with finding any ingredients because uh, the shops were open all the time despite the lockdown and the uh, our parents, they usually prepared the grape leaves during the summertime for the whole winter. So we had some of them prepared beforehand. Uh, that's why, like, it's also like one of the uh, features of Armenians. They usually love to prepare some stuff for winter during the summer so that they can, you know, be safe on that um Part. Uh, that's why we had a lot of stuff um, saved in some place. If something happens, we have some saved food. Uh, what about you? Did you have any problems with finding ingredients? I have heard the toilet paper story that everyone was buying toilet paper, but I just I wonder if you have any problems with finding food, which yeah. was yes, more necessary than toilet paper. <laughs> the toilet paper thing was ridiculous. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but in terms of food, you know, we would do a lot of ordering stuff from grocery stores we were never actually able to go in so sometimes it was really challenging to, like some stores wouldn't have their stock online so you would just kind of have to say what you wanted and hope that they had it there um and if you didn't know what brands they had it was kind of hard to specify so sometimes you might just get something and kind of not know what it would be and that was like we didn't really have a choice in the substitution <laughs> um that that's more like one of the smaller like local stores which you know we wanted to support them and stuff but it was it was kind of a fun adventure <laughs> um and you know just certain like things out of stock especially because you know as I said I'm dairy free so like it's kind of hard to find dairy free butter that I actually like like I'm very picky about what kind I can bake with because that'll affect the flavor of the dish a lot more than if you're just using it to like butter toast um and you know finding gluten-free flour as well like I, we ended up ordering some things off of Amazon like we ordered the canned jackfruit on Amazon and a bunch of the gluten-free flour and stuff like that and I don't like ordering things on Amazon just because it's kind of a, no a monopoly. But at the end of the day, I was able to bake pretty much everything I wanted. So, and that's, I'm, I'm way more into baking than cooking. Like I'll cook because I like eating savory food, but I bake because I like doing it. And I, I get intense and a little crazy about it. Like my family had an intervention with me. They're like, you're supposed to enjoy this. And I'm like, I do, but I'm just a little crazy about 
So yeah. Uh, <laughs> How about you, Denise? So here they ad, uh, advise people not to shop online. Only the elderly or people, those who are advised not to go out, were advised to shop online. But outside that, most people would shop in actual shops. Um, yeah, in the beginning, a lot of canned food weren't there. People were buying a lot of canned food. I think they were thinking there would be, I don't know, World War or, <laughs> or something. They couldn't leave the house up completely. But yeah, toilet paper, all this type of things that you need, uh, hand sanitizer, none of it you can find. But now now things are quite normal. Uh, I'm never able to cook traditional food from Saltome anyways because... There is no, there's, you don't have the herbs, the spices, the vegetables. So my, when I was in my aunt, she normally adapts it. So for example, we have a food called kalulu, and the main ingredient is a herb that you find in Sao Tome. So she did it with the other herbs. It was nice, but it wasn't the same. <laughs> so every time we try to cook food from Sao Tome, it's always a bit different. The only thing which is nice is when you do stew type of foods that we have, those ones were a bit more similar. Or um, smoke, not smoke. We normally grill fish or meat in carol barbecue. Charol barbecue? Yeah. yeah. Like charcoal? Charcoal, yeah, sorry. <laughs> charcoal. No, so I don't know. It, I think it makes the difference. But here you would just grill it. It's still nice. It's different, but <laughs> it's still nice. So in terms of finding ingredients to make or food, we, we can never, almost never find it. But in terms of just cooking in general, uh, we found most things. It wasn't really an issue. I also wanted to say that here in the UK, now they have a scheme to help restaurants, which is really good. It's called Eat Out to Help Out. So if you go to a restaurant, which are part of that scheme, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, you get 50% off if you eat uh, in a maximum of 20 pounds per person. So a lot of people have been going out and eating out lately this month of August because you have that deal. So imagine you go there and you pay 40 between two people. In the end, you're just paying 20 for between two people. It's really good. That's awesome. That's such a great idea to, you know, get um, some years ago. And I, what I could say is that, like, it feels like in UK, the breakfast is something. Like, you live for breakfast, and breakfast helps you to live. And it was really unique. It feels like, like, British breakfast is something worth trying with tea and food. It was really nice. Like they have this big breakfast, which has eggs, beans, bread. Yes, um, that one. Black, yeah, that's the traditional one. But people don't have it here every day. It would be too much. <laughs> yeah, it would be too yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted so I... to add. Oh yeah. Okay, go ahead. No, you can you can add first. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say when I was in Spain last summer, I was like so disappointed at breakfast time because, you know, we were we were in kind of a hostel um, type thing where they would provide, you know, lay stuff out on the table and it would be like some cookies, maybe like sometimes fruit, like one one type of fruit and like I don't know, maybe some bread with Nutella or like uh, not not quite Nutella, but like something that had like, you know, chocolate and like, I don't. And it was all just like really sweet and like nothing that could fill me. And every day I was like, I, I would just like fill up my pocket with cookies, I guess, because like that'll keep me through until lunch. And then finally I asked if they could get oatmeal. So then I would just eat oatmeal like plain. <laughs> And I'm yeah. sure that, like, you know, when you can go to the grocery store and stuff, you like they probably will, you know, eat something a little more hearty. But they really don't care about breakfast. I feel like, like, I couldn't even find places that were traditional, sp 
been restaurants that had breakfast mm. that you know was of any is significance but in the u.s it's like big pancakes waffles french toast those are like the three big things and you know eggs and sausage and bacon and you know we also don't have that every day for breakfast we just have peanut butter toast and an apple but like it's nice to go all out sometimes just get that really like filling breakfast mm. i think that's an interesting point because i think that's more uk american maybe friend type of culture to have big breakfast because in sao tome or even portugal i think it's a bit like spain we don't have massive we normally just have bread or cereal breakfast is not as big or different while lunch would be something you know more cultural where you see more of the culture more food or more variety and dinner also but breakfast wouldn't be that exciting <laughs> just talking about about breakfast, I really wanted to share this one thing with you. Uh, okay, so we have this. It's really hard to cook breakfast because it's like a whole soup, which Armenians, they usually eat it do, uh, early in the morning, like 7 uh, a.m. So <laughs> it's really funny because actually like February and beginning of March, when the coronavirus started, was the right period when people eat this. Uh, it is called khash. It is like um, soup, a really fatty soup. Let me just show you. Here it is. Can you Whoa. see? Yeah. It's like meat there, like a really fatty soup. So basically, it you know, it's, it's not a, even about soup. It's about the way, the ceremony that people, how people eat it. So it's like all the people come together in one house um you see how anti-corona thing i'm telling you so all the people come together in one house uh, early in the morning like 6 30 7 a.m and the woman of that house like the housewife she had to uh, start making this soup like one or two days before the gathering so it's ready because it takes a long time to cook it so when they come they just see uh, they have all the uh, small ingredients there like garlic and i don't know some salty things uh, cucumbers and vodka for <laughs> for sure and the yes <laughs> yeah, because it's, impo it's impossible to eat without some alcohol because, like, it's really, like, hard to digest thing. So that's why they eat early in the morning. So they have the whole day to, di to digest and mainly nothing else you eat during the day. So you know how hard it is. And it's like a whole tradition. Like people could never imagine a year without hush, and probably this was the one year when uh, we were just uh, I don't know eating online hush. Some people <laughs> probably did that, <laughs> but it's like not the same, of course. Uh, but yeah, it's like because of coronavirus, we didn't do this because like we couldn't. Um, come together with so many people and I don't know especially like to find a uh, fresh meat is really hard so yeah mm. <laughs> we skipped this one feels like m more healthy lifestyle is uh, <laughs> on in Armenia <laughs> yeah. that is absolutely nuts like <laughs> I you know I definitely brunch is like a big thing in America, you know, like bre like big breakfast at, you know, probably 11, 10 o'clock in the morning. And that will keep you full for a while, but nothing like that. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but that actually reminded me too, um, we definitely had trouble finding uh, frozen vegetables. That was a big thing that everyone bought out of the stores because they thought they wouldn't be able to go and get anything fresh. And they also were really worried about a meat shortage um, because of like all the processing that goes into it. So like 
yeah, unfortunately the processing that goes into it, but um, you know, the factories where, you know, people are in contact with each other and then they may contract COVID and then just trying to ship stuff. Like, I think this was kind of the first time that Americans realized what, like, like there are so many steps that go into our food and to get it to us. And so I think that's kind of pushed people to shop a lot more locally. Um, like farm stands right now are the thing because you can just pull over your car on the side of the road, hop out, grab your stuff and you're outside the whole time. You don't have to worry about going into a store about touching a bunch of surfaces that everyone else has touched. And there's like no shipping that goes into that. It's like someone threw a few boxes in the back of their truck and brought it to that spot. And I like, I am just so grateful that people are realizing that, you know, doing this is not only so much better for your health just by like buying something that was maybe like fresh or was even from two towns over. Um, but it's also way better for the environment because you're not, you know, a lot like produce will come from Brazil and Chile and like, I can't, I can't even, there's just so many places. Um, and a lot of like carbon output is like put into that and it's just I'm, I'm hoping that people are realizing like wow okay like we can actually get stuff around here and that's obviously harder in the winter but I'm hoping some good for the earth kind of comes out of this too um do you guys have any access to like gardens How, do your families do any gardens or do you have any in your communities mm. well here it's often it's I mean, where I am at least, which is more rural area now, um, a lot of people have the grow uh, vegetables in their gardens, but I don't think it's that popular in Liverpool, for example, or a bigger town, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, it's um, in Armenia, like Armenia overall is a very small country. So it's really easy to move from the city to a rural area. And besides, we have like special shops in the city where people from rural areas, they can bring their products and sell in the city. So um, of course, like people have access to these like natural uh, products. And besides, uh, they can just, uh, I mean, we have this, you know, um, relatives come from uh, villages or rural areas to your houses and they usually bring some really fresh products and yes um, honestly I feel like Armenia is one of the countries that we are really supplied by the natural products it's really uh, easy to get them uh, and I, I feel like a lot of families have their gardens we do have them like we have some apricots and some vegetables I, I really love to take care of through them because, you know, it's like nature and you just enjoy that you can put a seed and in a year you can come and like pick up your product and take it home. So I really love all the agricultural things. Yeah, I am the worst gardener because I just, <laughs> I love love the end product don't love all the work that goes into it so i've been trying to learn you know like <laughs> um my mom and my sister are very big gardeners so my sister just created a huge garden out in our front yard uh this year and i don't know like yes plants we can see all. some plants there yeah they're like more over this way and like <laughs> oh. <laughs> um you know we've I don't even know if we what we have on my counter right now, but like we have a ton of banana peppers. I don't know if you guys um, we like to pickle those, and they're just so good. Like I love them in the summer. They like you know add that little bit of um, saltiness to a salad or something. And for some reason, we decided to plant a ton of squash. So like <laughs> we obviously we we haven't had a huge output. Um, yet 
And I don't know if you guys have heard about like people getting shipped uh, seeds from China in, in America. Uh, I don't know if they are doing it anywhere else, but like people are getting seeds for, in the mail. Um, and it's strange because one person, one person planted them and maybe some more did, but like, you know, they're really worried about them being invasive and like, also why would you plant them? Um, and it comes out looking like a spaghetti squash. I don't know if you guys have heard of those. It's like a yellow kind of like oblong, like, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and so we, we did not plant that. And yet now it's in our yard. Like we are very confused about like what, what is going on right now? Like why, and the spaghetti squash is plant, like is popping up everywhere. People didn't buy it, but it's just growing. And like, I'm I'm so confused. Like, are you are you ready to try it? <laughs> oh, we we love it. Like, on it. So the reason it's called spaghetti squash is because when you roast it, um, like it has a bunch of long strands instead of being like you know kind of a squishy or you know like mm. with zucchini or something. So you take a fork and you can like um kind of peel the strands out uh and then it creates almost like a spaghetti that i i like to do with sauce i know like i feel like american culture towards food is very much like how can it fuel me rather than you know rather than fo focusing on taste or like and and that's something i'm not a huge fan of um but if you do this right <laughs> it will taste good and it is definitely one of those things that Americans, you know, love that it's low carb and um, that kind of thing. I have a question. So mm -hmm. do you guys feel like cultural diversity in your countries uh, influenced on food? Like the, what do you eat? I mean, a hundred percent. We have people from everywhere and uh Michelle Obama, when she was the first lady, um, actually changed, you know, kind of like the slogan um, from America is a melting pot to America is a salad bowl. And that was a question on a test in eighth grade as to why she changed it. And I totally got it wrong because I was like, oh, she's just she likes being healthy. <laughs> <laughs> no what she meant is that when people come over from their different countries rather than all of us becoming the same person and the same like culture everyone contributes all of their stuff and so there's definitely kind of like American culture you know like um and you know burgers and like in the summer we do barbecues and like that kind of thing um but we are so much richer because of all of the people that have come and you know like on i like i at least in my own town can choose from having indian food chinese food thai food vietnamese um obviously italian italian is <laughs> huge um i can't even i there has to be more but like Mexican. Yes, Mexican, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and and it's actual good food, and like not every single place is as good as you know the culture. Like like some people will try and you know they probably didn't even come from the culture, which is not great. Um, but there, like I have plenty of friends who are from those places and actually enjoy the food. Um, so. I would say that we're absolutely better off by everything that people have brought to this country. Um, isn't Connecticut famous for their pizzas? Because I studied there for a semester and I went to the world's greatest, best pizza place. No, you have, is it, what was it called? Um, there are a few in New Haven. Um, I. I probably couldn't, I don't know which one people think is the best. This I'm such a failure because I don't eat cheese. So I uh, probably haven't been. To oh, because we I'm went so there bad. and 
it was open obviously by Italian, but now it's your it's your restaurant, your reference as yes. State, um, so. I'm trying to think. Sal's, uh, Sally's. Oh God, I everyone's gonna yell at me if they see this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like such a bad because <laughs> I've lived outside of New Haven my whole entire life. Um, <laughs> Pepe, Pepe, Pepe's. Um, I I don't know which. <laughs> Yes, but we we have a bunch of, you know, it's really famous for like the flat, uh, the thin crusted pizza. Um, And generally it's like very minimal toppings. Sometimes like the white clam of pizza is like where it's at. And you generally know if it's good pizza because it's like the title has a pizza rather than pizza if you just have that a squished right in front of the pizza then that's like real pizza <laughs> so yeah that is a, like a, a really like disadvantage of armenia because okay we are proud of the food we have it's super traditional and uh unique but therefore like you can't eat that food all year like you want to try something else something okay we have some italian good italian food but what comes to seafood is what we really lack because we don't have sea or ocean around and we can't try any seafood here i mean well of course there are some um, <laughs> trials but they are not like not even close to what it looks like and because we don't have the diversity we it's like almost 98 probably percent of Armenians living in Armenia, uh, we're like just, okay, this is the food we have, okay? So you can just try different things and like, I don't know, have, have fun with this. But uh, that's why like, this is the disadvantage of being uh, mm. fully one, na like only one nation in a country. Yeah, I understand what you mean. I think the smaller the country, the less other cuisines you have yeah. because I won't find a lot in Sao Tome or even in Portugal compared to UK. It's so much easier to go for to a Japanese or Mexican or whatever restaurant than those countries. Oh, I wanted to ask why have you, so what did you change more mostly for you since lockdown? What kind of food have you been eating more? I think here because it's it's it has been a sunny weather most of the lockdown. We've been having a lot of barbecues. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's the main difference for me. How about you guys? Daniel, you want to start? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so definitely here as soon as summer hit barbecues, that was like it, you know, because you can sit outside and that was a great way um, to be socially distant from my grandparents uh, who live like five minutes away from me. Um, but I just had so much more time for cooking and like, you know, during the school year, I would generally just like prepare all of my meals like on a Sunday I would do all my dinners all my lunches and it's just like salad meat and vegetables like that was it um and so now that quarantine like you know when when quarantine started I was finding all kinds of recipes I was just like you know I, I needed diversity in my food choices after eating the same thing for weeks on end <laughs> um and in terms of cooking, like, I couldn't even tell you because it's just, again, like, I like baking. <laughs> um, but in terms could of be baking, baking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in terms of baking, um, I made a banana bread coffee cake, which kind of, it sounded really gross to me at first because I was like, ew, that's going to be way too sweet. But it was probably like the best dessert I've ever made. And you can't have like too much because it is a lot. But I won a baking contest at Southern because of it. <laughs> and, like my family just I, like it, it didn't even make it to the next morning. Like I probably 
finished making it at 10 o'clock at night and it was gone by the next morning. It is it is like the professional level of baking, you know, <laughs> it's not like... <laughs> yeah, and, and it was also gluten-free and dairy-free because that's how I have to do everything. Um, and actually, you know, I uh, had mentioned that we were just in Maine and um, we were we were on our uh, friend's blueberry farm. So, you know, we were nice social distancing because no one else was there. It was just us. Um, and we got like, you know, like sh brown paper shopping bags like that you'd get from the grocery store. We got four bags of those pretty full um, that we like raked out of the um out of the fields like you you have the prongs on the end um and then there's like a little bucket part that can catch it um and you just kind of rake into the bushes um and then we hand picked probably like four gallons of blueberries um so i can actually show you guys uh i'll <laughs> <laughs> this is just so it's just like one bowl that like is probably a third of one bag if that made any sense i don't know if it did um let's see <laughs> but my fridge oh, is stacked wow. so this is, is do you had three times more is that what you meant when you picked it? yeah this, wow. so this this is not even a full uh grocery bag like the you know how i described the paper bags yeah this is probably a third of one of those shopping bags and i don't know if i can show this to you guys without tipping all the blueberries out um but they're hold on i'll try to angle the camera down at it <laughs> um so there are tons of leaves in them because this is what we raked so we have to sit and like pick all of the leaves out of these before we can freeze them to use them for stuff. Um, so it's quite a tedious process, but totally worth it once you get to use it. Um, you know, we'll, if we're freezing them, we'll use them for like uh, baking or smoothies or something like that. Uh, and I actually currently have high dough I made pie dough yesterday, gluten-free, mm. dairy-free. Um, so that's, I just have to pick the leaves out before I can finish the pie. <laughs> so yeah, that is, that is all I have to say. <laughs> How about you, Maria? <laughs> okay, so as I said, like all Armenian food is like super fatty and it's like fat, fat and fat everywhere. <laughs> And the thing about it was that when you eat, you go out and you walk so you can like digest. And here is the thing, you eat and you can't move because, I mean, it's a lockdown. <laughs> That's why I was kind of trying to uh, escape Armenian traditional food. And I was trying, you know, to experiment with some, I don't know, to cook some rice from... I don't know, trying to do it in a different way that we haven't tried yet. So I was just trying to eat some basic food, not the traditional one, so I could survive. And then uh, I guess it was the beginning of June when the apricot season started. And after that, uh, what I ate was like apricot for breakfast, apricot for lunch and apricot for dinner. <laughs> And I just want you guys to show we had this card, uh, we had an apricot garden. So look how, how like it's all apricots everywhere. Wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's crazy. <laughs> it's like apricots wow. for a day, you know. <laughs> yeah. We're not, and we're not tired yet. <laughs> <laughs> After that, I'm not buying apricots anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it was basically apricots, apricots, and apricots every day. <laughs> wow, that's how I feel about blueberries right now. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's right. <laughs> 
I can I can send you some apricots. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I'll send you some blueberries. <laughs> uh, oh actually, my god. We actually also been trying to bake. I know we don't do it, but my boyfriend is more into cooking than me. <laughs> so we tried to bake, and once we did the rhubarb crumble. Uh, have you heard mm. of crumble? That don't know if it's only UK, but yeah, and that was the first time I ate a crumble. Just. No, sorry. It was the first time I ate rhubarb. I never ate it before, and it was really, really nice. So we try to bake sometimes. I mean, he pushes me, but <laughs> we try to bake more often and different things. Recipes we just find online, just to not be bored, <laughs> I guess. It was actually my first time trying rhubarb this year as well, and I made kind mm. of like um, it was strawberry rhubarb kind of crumble bars, I guess. Um, and I was I was enjoying it. That was, I made it on Mother's Day and that was kind of in place of gifts because it was so weird to try and obtain them that I just decided to bake things for people. <laughs> um, so I, I gave people those, I did blueberry muffins before we had all of our blueberries. <laughs> um, <laughs> But did, did you guys do, like, any special cooking for holidays and stuff? I don't know um, maybe what kinds of holidays you had and how that might have been different in terms of food. Mm. Well, Easter here, we they normally have um, Sunday roast, which is basically roast with Yorkshire puddings, which is... I don't know how to explain that. It's it's basically just flour, eggs, and it's basically like a pastry, but you eat it with veg. You put the, uh, the chicken, the roast in it, and you put gravy. It goes part of the, the, in the roast. And they had vegetables, so we had that for Easter, which I normally don't do Easter like that because it's more UK celebration, but I was with my boyfriend's family, so we had it. And we also had more eggs, more chocolate eggs than normally. Because <laughs> I think people just decided to come by and drop eggs just to say hello. <laughs> Excuse to say hello. So we had, I had three chocolate eggs for myself. Each person had three big ones for themselves. And Whoa. yeah, it was a lot of chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Well, it took me almost until the next month to finish <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Maria? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that we had a lot of uh, like special cookings for uh, holidays because it's pretty much the same what we had every day. Uh, but yes, the, for Easter, it's also eggs for us, but we like we love to decorate them. But I don't think that people did that this year because again, like we can't come together uh with everyone even i i want to mention that even like barbecues right we love barbecues all the armenians love barbecues but uh we usually eat barbecues when there are like a lot of people because it's like uh, of, uh like weekend and everyone comes together and they eat barbecue and when they can't come together feels like no one is eating barbecue because they are not used to it alone it's like super strange for us to sit alone at home and eat barbecue <laughs> even with your family like it's kind of strange <laughs> i'm actually and, curious oh sorry yeah yeah go ahead it's okay I, well, I'm just curious, what do you guys eat at your barbecues? I like both of you, like I have, I know what Americans eat, but I don't know, like, is it different from what you guys eat in Armenia or uh, England or, yeah. It's absolutely different in Armenia because, well, we usually eat only um, meat. Like when we say barbecue, we mainly mean the meat and it's not like, it's like a piece of meat. It's not any kind of, uh, I don't know, changed. Like the meat is just the way it is initially and they just cook it. Uh, and usually it's, uh, they may do some potatoes with it or some vegetables. But when we say barbecue, we just uh, mean the piece of 
meet and I just remember this really funny story when I was doing a camp in London and uh, one day they said like hey guys we're going to do a barbecue evening tonight and I'm like okay this is really cool because I was like really hungry and uh, like the food was not really um casual for me I was not used to that and I'm like oh my god this is so cool we're gonna have some barbecue and when I came I was looking at the barbecue and I'm like oh my god this is not the barbecue I used to eat it's so strange <laughs> that's why like Armenians when we say barbecue is just a piece of meat <laughs> what about you <laughs> So why because here it's normally we have sausage, we have burgers, things like that. Oh, yes. We don't but have we that. also have uh, kebabs. So uh-huh. you know, the meats that you put in a I said bit of wood. <laughs> so we oh, have yes. that with ve- can have vegetables in between, that's nice. And you can even have fish with that. Uh, sometimes you have uh, salmon but kebabs, you can have different ones. So it depends, it's very different. Even corn on the hop, sometimes you put corn on the barbecue. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then normally you have bits not not that didn't go to the barbecue, you just put it with the barbecue, like salad, you have chips, you have um, uh, olives, you know, things like that to grab while you eat cheese, all these type of things. So it's very different. Some people have fancier barbecues with the meat, kebab, fish, and other people have the very simple with sausage and burger, that's all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hot dogs and hamburgers is like everyone's go-to. I'm, I personally don't like hot dogs, um, but my family will always do like barbecue chicken or something like that, or you know, like maybe steak or um, what is, uh, Corn, you, you know, you can just throw on, like you said. Um, but all kinds of vegetables we'll just put on and, you know, figure out, see if it works. <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's same kind of, like, you know, we'll, we'll also just throw stuff on the grill. And, you know, it's not necessarily just a barbecue, I guess. I don't know. But hot dogs, hamburgers is the most classic style with, like, yeah, potato chips. <laughs> it's so interesting that in Armenia, like it's the tradition is that it's men making the barbecue because usually we say that women cook, but what if it concerns to barbecue, it's a man's stuff. So men usually do the barbecue, and they can also do like barbecue uh, eggplants and like I don't know uh, peppers there, and when they do it. Like after that, women should take it and like make something unique with like the vegetables. So it usually goes with the meat barbecue, but meat barbecue is usually and always, I guess, made by by men because it's like hard and the fire and stuff. They take all the hard things on themselves and the easier things on women. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure because you said that they take one one day to cook something. That looks harder. <laughs> yeah, women have the hard job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, men are outside, you know, they are like outside and like burning fire and stuff. And women are, I mean, this, this sounds like a bit strange, right? I, I think this sounds strange, but still it kind of, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I get what you mean. <laughs> and I think that kind of idea exists in some form in the U.S. where it's like it, in my own house, my dad, you know, we're just like, oh, can you go out and do the grilling? Because we just like, you know, that's what he wants to be doing. But at the same time, there are like all kinds of women who, you know, they don't care about grilling like yeah and and we all know how to do it too it's just like we have the the choice but at the same time I think there's still that societal implication or expectation that like oh if if there's a guy there he'll probably be the one to do it but at the same time there like I know so many guys who know nothing about grilling they don't know how to use it at all and like you know, my sister and I all the time will, you know, go down to the beach, make a little campfire and 
cook our food over that or something. And it's, it's not strange or unexpected. It's just like, you, if there's a guy there, oh, he'll make the fire. Or like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's still kind of that implicit expectation. Yeah, I think it's the same here. It's normally the, the men who would light the fire and cook the barbecue. And then they'll put in the plate and everyone serves or things like that. <laughs> oh, you talked about beaches. And that reminds me that in Sao Tome, we very often have barbecue in beach, in beaches. So people would either bring the portable grill thing or they would have, you know, bricks in the beach and you would just make it. But it's very often to have barbecue there in the beach and then just eat and go to the beach, to the water, which is really nice. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things, you know, it's my, my uncle owned a restaurant. And so when we're out um, in Cape Cod, I don't know if that makes sense. Like if you guys know anything about Cape Cod, um, but it's, it's in Massachusetts, which is like above us. And they just have the most gorgeous beaches. And so we'd go out, he would make a fire in the sand, you know, put down, um, a little thing for grilling on top of it and like he would cook up fish that he had caught that day or like you know whatever he had we'd eat it with our hands we didn't even like have plates or utensils or anything um and then s'mores that was always like the end of the night s'mores we gotta like we'd find a huge branch and have like 10 marshmallows all at the same time like <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny because actually in Armenia we don't have sea and we don't have ocean. We just yeah. have one we just have one single lake, but like local people they call it sea because it, it just looks big. So they call it sea and when like during the summertime they go for a barbecue there like with big groups. So they go there. It's like it's absolutely a lake, but they pretend as if it's you know it's a beach and like summer and stuff. And they like uh, the holiday feels like the same, but it's absolutely different. So yeah, and like it's watermelon. You know, watermelon should always come after the barbecue. I mean, it's just tradition. It, it, now when I'm telling, it sounds so strange for me, even for me. But I mean, it's still it's. So like uh, clearly uh, decided that everyone is just doing that. <laughs> Watermelon is definitely a barbecue classic. That's not too strange. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I don't know if you guys have ever tried to grow a watermelon, but it is so incredibly disappointing because you will spend <laughs> the whole summer growing this thing and in the end, it is like this big, maybe, maybe. And then you cut into it and it's all green on the inside. Like I, every time I've tried to grow a watermelon where I live, like, oh my gosh, it is so sad. <laughs> you should try it in a sunny place. I, I feel like it should be like a hot weather for watermelon. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have no clue what the climate is, but I'm assuming they need a lot of water, maybe? I'm probably not great at that. <laughs> oh, how about desserts? What, what do you normally have in desserts in Romania, Maria? Um, okay, so again, it's like super traditional. It is called gata. Um, it's like, I, I don't even know how to explain it, it's just like um, tart with some really specific things in it. I don't even know how to explain, feels like I can just, you can just check it, it's called gata. Uh, but it feels like we don't have a lot of desserts here because uh, the main food is so much and it's like a lot that you you don't even need to eat something else there you know mm. can That's you type it in the meeting shot oh yes sure yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. let me do it it is cool <laughs> we even have a musical it's like a group musical group it's called gata <laughs> oh. um 
Do you guys do you guys do a lot of ice cream at all? Like any ice cream? We eat but don't make it. <laughs> that was that was one of my big quarantine fails. I tried to make like dairy free ice cream and it was not good. <laughs> there are just sometimes you have to experiment and Sometimes you go too far off the beaten path and it is frightening, but. Don't you need a machine to make ice cream? <laughs> the um, ice cream maker. So we do, we do have like probably the oldest ice cream maker you've ever seen that like my parents used to bring into school when we were kids and we'd all just like make ice cream. It's this like wooden bucket that has like a metal container and then the ice goes around it and you like salt the ice so that it gets really cold and you churn it. Um, but with this, you like, you made it in a food processor and then cooked it to thicken it, which is what you do with a lot of like, if you're trying to make a dairy free cheese or something. Um, and then you just put it in the freezer and like, it, it's not necessarily the texture you might desire, um, but I just, it like, I think I could do it better just with a different recipe. Like it's, <laughs> but you can also, um, like a fun activity with kids even, is to just take some like cream, the basic ingredients like sugar and vanilla, um, put that in one like gallon Ziploc bag, and then put another Ziploc bag around it with ice and salt. And then that keeps the kids occupied for quite a long time. They just have to shake it around. And like, <laughs> it's, it's a great way to keep them busy and tire them out. So if you're ever wondering. <laughs> I have a question, guys. Do you prefer, like, uh, what do you drink in your country? Coffee, tea, what's more? What's like... Mm, what do you drink? Well, here in the UK, they eat a lot of tea. tea. <laughs> One thing that is interesting about the tea is that they have the English tea, which is almost like black tea, and they add milk to it, which is, you normally know, don't see that in other European countries, <clears throat> people adding milk. Uh, Portugal, we drink a lot of coffee, and Sao Tome would be mixture. But we like to have tea with uh, traditional uh, herbs. And one of them is Mikondo. It's really nice. How about you? Yeah. <laughs> um, tea is big in my house. And I, I might like, you know, we use an electric kettle, which might be disappointing. Um, <laughs> um, but we have like two full shelves of tea that are constantly like falling all over the place because we just have way too much tea. Um, and then my brother is obsessed with coffee. Like I feel like coffee is very popular in America just because we're always rushing. Like we're, you know, we've, we're just trying to do everything at once. Um, and so my brother will have like a big water bottle or whatever of pure black coffee and like I love the taste of black coffee I'm probably very strange um but if I drink it you know it makes my heart race it makes me sweaty like <laughs> so I I generally stick to tea for a much more calming thing and then lemonade is huge in the summer um there haven't been a whole lot of lemonade stands this year I think because kids were worried about I mean parents were probably telling you know don't don't do this during a pandemic um but that's always fun to come across I just wanted uh, to add that uh, recently I, I went to a workshop about tea how to make tea how to drink tea and uh, the person who was leading it he said that you know for tea you need to be calm you need to uh, you need certain environment to talk about tea and just like only about positive things and stuff and at that time I realized why we don't drink drink tea at all here <laughs> we are like super coffee nation it's like a whole traditional thing to drink coffee it's mainly like women come together they make a lot 
lot of Armenian tea, uh, Armenian coffee, and then sit, they sit all together and discuss like different stuff, like jumping from one topic to another, and it's like all combined with the with some candies or sweets with it. So yes, we are super coffee nation. <laughs> I noticed when I was in Connecticut that people drink a lot of uh, iced coffee. Yeah. yeah. I noticed in the campus everyone had an iced coffee almost. And everyone loves their, their iced coffee and something that I don't entirely understand. Starbucks will do a lot of like crazy drinks that don't even have like any coffee in them and people are obsessed with them and like personally I like I love to drink water this is you know what I have on a regular basis and I can drink one of those in like 30 minutes but I personally want stuff out of what I'm drinking like I don't want to just drink something (laughs) I don't I don't know like it's I I do wish that I had more of like a a view on food that I should eat just to enjoy it and I definitely like that's something that Americans don't do is that like either we'll eat something and then we feel bad about it because it's called it's like junk food or you know like we're so obsessed with trying to eat healthy and if you look at France versus the United States obesity is way less of a problem in France because they eat to enjoy their food. Whereas here we're so obsessed with like diet culture and like, you know, eating to get stuff out of your food rather than enjoy it. And then that's just, that's like a big thing that I've, I've also kind of noticed during quarantine is just how do I enjoy myself? We can relate definitely on that point. (laughs) Yeah, you, Maria, you were trying to escape your food. (laughs) (laughs) Did you find any, uh, did you, could you make healthier versions of Armenian food? That's really hard. That's absolutely hard to do. I mean, you can, but the taste will be completely different. So it's like a new product. (laughs) Yeah. And for and for vegetarians and vegans, it's like uh, Armenia is not a place. <laughs> oh. We have meat and meat and meat everywhere. Uh, only about like Gata, we don't have meat in Gata. In all the other things, we have meat and meat and meat. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, guys, for sharing today. Um, Food culture is interesting because it's one thing that is sort of accessible to us anywhere, right? Um, be difficult to some ingredients, um, but we have the world at our fingertips online. And if you try hard enough, you can probably find anything you need to create a specific taste from another culture. We also have access to amazing resources like YouTube, where amateur chefs can upload their versions of their favorite local food. Um, we can really find authentic recipes uh, and attempt to replicate them on our own. I think during this time, we really have to look for alternative ways to immerse ourselves in other cultures. Um, I know I am inspired by today's conversation. I'm going to start with some iced coffee right away and then move on to a full English breakfast, maybe some barbecue for dinner and some gata for dessert. So thank you for the chat. Um, Thank you for the recipes and the inspiration and the ideas. And we will see you guys uh, next time. Thank you a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you.